Okay, um, my name is John. I haven't um, been in here a whole lot, but I have met some of you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give an introduction um, to quantum mechanics and to, to, and to quantum information um, in order to provide a little bit of the tools to, to try to um, introduce some of the research that we're doing. So the punchline of the research is you've been studying computational mechanics in the Epsilon machine all quarter. And we'd like to understand, roughly speaking, what is the quantum analog of this thing or, or this pro or this program. And um, so expecting that there's going to be a variety of backgrounds here. I don't know what everyone's background is. Um, I was told to, to, to do this kind of, kind of uh, in a relaxed fashion. So um, hopefully someone or hopefully everyone can take away something from this. And then next time, We'll get into some of the more research type questions that will make use of these tools. And um, if any of you are interested, the reference that I use constantly is this reference here, Quantum Computation and Quantum Information by Nielsen and Chuang. And if you don't have a copy of that and you're interested in this stuff, this is a fabulous reference. Okay, so um, for those of you that know this, this is obvious, but for those of you that maybe don't, well, maybe it's good to, to sort of get a feeler. Um, who's had any quantum mechanics at all? I know you have. Okay. And who's had, so who's had no quantum mechanics? Okay, one, two. And who's had grad quantum? Okay, so good, a good mix. Okay. All right. Um, so hopefully uh, everyone's at least heard of the idea of spectra, atomic spectra. The idea that when you, you look at, say, the sun and you put it through a diffraction grating, um, you don't get a complete rainbow. You get particular colors that are highlighted. And this has to do with the fact that there are, are uh, particular electronic transitions going on in the sun. And, and we have, of course, simpler examples of this. So a quantum theory is good for explaining spectra. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to spend much time or any time on these other things other than the the Stern Garlock experiment, which we'll come back to later, which is a really nice um, uh, physical implementation of a very simple quantum measurement. So we'll, we'll be coming to that one. But these other, the photoelectric effect, uh, which is the idea that you need a certain amount of minimum energy to liberate um, electrons from from a surface, and then the double slit experiment, which has to do with sending photons through two nearby slits and seeing that there is an interference pattern, even if you have just one photon coming in at a time. So quantum theory is good for all of these things, and I'm going to try to give you some of the, the real basics for understanding these things. And to make it seem a little bit more modern and exciting, there are some things, this isn't exactly real recent, well, a D wave is recent, but here's some stuff that's going on uh, as outgrowths of quantum mechanics um, in the world of quantum information, and I guess these are really more quantum computation. So people are particularly interested in using quantum substrates for developing algorithms to do things that you can't do, or at least we don't know how to do yet, um, classically. So for instance, the Shor, Shor factoring al algorithm um, allows us to factorize integers um, faster than any known classical algorithm. Uh, over here we have this giant machine produced by the company D-Wave that was sold for how many millions of dollars to? Ten. $10 million dollars to Google. Um, so this is exciting because people are people are actually building these things. Uh, this is we, we've come a long way since Schrodinger in terms of the implementation of some of these ideas. Um, I have a question mark there because kind of interestingly there's a lively debate about really what this D-Wave machine is actually doing and is it actually a quantum computer or if it is a quantum computer exactly what kind of a quantum computer is it. So that's neat too that there's a lot of debate going on. This is by no means straightforward. Um, another algorithm, Grover's algorithm, allows us to do a search in um, root n time as opposed to the provably fastest classical time which is n, n time. And then over here, there have been some recent papers about this idea that you can actually have an ambiguity in 
in the causal ordering of things, that is that you can you can implement um, you can implement operations that are in uh, the operations themselves are in a in a time superposition. So it's unclear which one came first, or they actually kind of both came first. So a lot of interesting stuff going on lately. So hopefully that gets you kind of excited. And so to, to make things less exciting, some bullet points. Um, these are some of the things that I'm going to try to get through today or, or early in the next time. So hopefully you'll be able to have some kind of an understanding of what a quantum state is. Something, uh, some, some intuition for what a quantum measurement does how, and how to write one down, how to compute things. And then this idea of quantum mixed states. If you've had a little bit of quantum mechanics, but maybe not more quantum mechanics, you might have not been exposed to quantum mixed states. And then uh, the difference between these mixtures and quantum superpositions. And then I'll probably get to talk about quantum entropy a little bit and um, entanglement if we have time, but we'll probably save that for next time. Okay, and then I guess back up again a little bit, uh, leading you towards some of the research ideas. These are, these are really vague and big questions that we have in our research group. And, and just the summary, sort of, is what is the quantum analog of all this computational mechanics stuff? But because quantum mechanics uh, and quantum information has unique features, we also have a new opportunity to map these new features over and ask questions like, um, well, entanglement. Entanglement is a, is a new feature of this quantum land that we're going to build these quantum epsilon machines in. And it's, it's thought to be very important in this um, design of quantum algorithms. So if that's true, and we have quantum representations or quantum epsilon machines, then what is entanglement doing in these representations? And this is a very open question. We can talk a little bit about it next time. And um, even questions a lot that have this sort of a flavor, are there processes that you might, from a standard physics perspective, look at and label as quantum that, according to this type of analysis, don't really have this entanglement feature, and so in that way aren't really as quantum, or, or things that you would label as classical that actually turn out to be well represented with a system that has entanglement. So, is there some kind of um, ambiguity or maybe novelty, uh, some, some new perspectives that we have on old um, categorizations of things when we look at processes using these quantum representations? And that kind of leads into this last question. Um, we think about representations, that is the epsilon machine is one representation. Uh, you've, I think you've talked about non unifilar representations a bit and mixed state representations with transients, um, representations, have you gone through sync control with the, the oracular and the gauge or, uh, components of, of redundant representations? So we think a lot about representations and um, what, what the various aspects of the representations mean, what the, what the physical consequences of these things are. And so if we have a quantum representation, we'd like to know something, we'd like to derive a physical consequence from this and maybe say something about the naturalness of this of this quantum representation, which is a little bit vague, but we, we try to make this more precise in the research questions that we'll get to next time. So hopefully that's some kind of motivation and um, a little bit of orientation. Okay, quantum states. So if you've never seen this thing before, that might, might seem kind of shocking, but all it means is some vector it's a denotation of a vector. The brackets mean that it's a, a vector, and this psi in the middle is just the label. So it lives in a complex vector space. Sometimes we call that a Hilbert space. But for everything that I'm going to do today, um, I'm just going to stick with the, the extremely finite dimensional, because um, most things that are interesting to me uh, can be extracted from finite dimensional systems. Um, so that makes life easy. <clears throat> So a particular quantum vector or quantum state can be represented using this orthonormal basis. So here I, I label them 0 and 1. Some people might label them up and down or dog and cat. And then each of these is given some kind of quantum amplitude or these coefficients which we refer to as quantum amplitudes. And so given any basis, I can represent any quantum vector in that basis.
And sometimes this 0, 1 is referred to as the computational basis in quantum information or quantum computation. And in the back of your mind, um, once you fix a basis, you should really just be imagining that these coefficients uh, uh, sit here and look like some ordinary vector, except that the coefficients are complex. And so we're just doing linear algebra with uh, complex elements. Okay, so it shouldn't be... Some of the no notation gets a little bit um, confusing at times, but there's really nothing beyond linear algebra going on. <clears throat> okay, so a vector space means that we've got an addition, we've got a scalar multiplication, and should, I, sh should we go through these in a little more detail, these properties of addition in a vector space? Would that be useful? Sure. Okay, so if you've got two, two vectors that live in your vector space, and in this particular basis they have these expansions or these representations or coefficients, um, you can just think of these as two vectors in R2, if you like. Um, all this means is that we have some way of adding them. And they add in this way, which you would intuit, which is that the zero component is added to the zero component and the one component is added to the one component. So this is the addition of complex numbers. And then scalar multiplication is the same thing. Multiplying a, a vector by an overall scalar just gives you that scalar attached to each of the coefficients inside. Okay, so this is a, a scaling of, of the vector. And the most interesting thing here is going to be this inner product. So um, the inner product is, is a very important uh, construct for understanding um, much of what we're going to be interested in, which comes later, um, so we'll get to it later. But anyway, the inner product here has a little bit of a twist to it because we have these stars, which means that instead of just having the, the standard inner product in, uh, in a real space where we would have the product of the x co or the zero coefficients and then the product of the one coefficients, we put a star or a complex conjugate on the first of the pair. Um, and this has the property that it ensures that um, the inner product with yourself or the norm of anything remains real. Okay. So let's give ourselves, um, again, I said I was going to stay really finite dimensional. And in fact, we're going to be as small dimensional as we can without being, without going to sleep. So we're going to do two dimensions. And sometimes people call this uh, qubit if you've got a quantum state that's sitting in two dimensions, bit for obviously. Um, binary, and Q for quantum, so qubit, Q-U-B-I-T. And I think that was Shor's word that he came up with. Okay, so given this particular uh, um, coordinatization of psi, the vector psi, I'm just going to replace alpha and beta with these quantities. This is a, a way to write any old complex number. And I'm going to pull out this same factor in front, this phase factor, leaving behind some unknown um, complex number here. And when I ask that this thing be normalized, which I'm going to ask as a requirement of all my quantum states, what I find is that this phase factor out front, uh, which I've introduced purposefully into both of these two terms, comes out. But because this is in this inner product here, where we multiply, um, uh, where we have a star attached to the, the left or the dual vector. Um, so if you refer to this as a vector, you would refer to this as the dual vector. Then the um, e to the i gamma gets multiplied by an e to the minus i gamma. And so we just get the modulus of this thing, which is 1. And so we're left with this constraint which is a constraint on the sum of the squares of three real numbers. And what that all means is that this thing really can be thought of as living on the surface of a sphere. So a qubit is just the surface of a sphere. Okay, and we can be a little bit more um, exact about this. So here's this global phase again, which I, I extract and I claim is non-physical. And um, we can actually have a mapping between the sphere 
using these um, standard spherical coordinates and the vectors 0 and 1. And this is a little bit strange, um, or you have to look at this twice, because typically you would think of the two orthogonal basis elements of a vector space as being like x and y. But here I'm telling you that the two um, orthogonal basis elements are 0 and 1. So you have to stare a little bit when you look at uh, vectors in this representation to make sure you understand what orthogonality means. So, for instance, the vector 0 is orthogonal to the vector 1. Um, this vector is not orthogonal to this vector here, even though they're orthogonal in the, in the sense of being orthogonal in R2. Should I pause for questions? I hope you guys interrupt me a lot so we can talk rather than me just talking the whole time. Yeah? Can you just do like an example point how you get the coordinates? Um, how about an example theta and phi? Or, yeah. Uh, so let's see. Oh, geez, you're going to. Um, yeah. So so the x just depends on phi. Oh, OK. OK. Well, don't make me do algebra on the fly. But here we go. <clears throat> So we, um, we're limiting ourselves to the unit sphere. So um, the x and y coordinates just depend on phi. So that's cosine phi, sine phi. And then uh, this isn't right. These are moderated by cosine theta, right? Or rather, sine theta. Did I get that right? Z is cosine theta. Thank you. Okay, we got there. So you give me any, any um, theta and phi, I give you the x, y, z coordinate that sits on the sphere, use that same theta and phi, Plug it in here, and you've got your coefficients for your for your qubit. And why is gamma unphysical? Why is gamma unphysical? Um, well, I guess we'll see that when we get to a couple slides. For now, but that's a good question. Okay, um, and then I wanted to make the point that this is. Um, instead of being the projective Hilbert space, this is actually the Hilbert space, and this to your question. Um, let's see if I can do this. Uh, and this actually has to do, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but this has to do with the factor of two here. Um, and the idea you may have heard that when you, um, for those of that, that have had some quantum, the idea that when you rotate, uh, say, uh, an electron or a spin one half particle, when you rotate it around, it somehow doesn't come back to itself. Have you heard this idea? Okay, you rotate it around and it comes back to itself, but it has a, a minus sign attached. So this minus sign is is part of this global phase, so it's not physical, or it's, it's not um, in and of itself observable, but it's a mathematical fact that it comes back, or at least in this model, that it comes back around to itself. Um, but these two points are identified in this, uh, in this sphere representation. So no matter what that, what, no matter what that gamma is, um, it doesn't come into the computation of x, y, and z. So there are many different, all, all vectors um, that, that are the same up to a global phase have the same point on this sphere. And so, without, again, without going into all the details, I'm just gonna show you a cool little thing here. This is related to what is called the, the Dirac belt trick. Have you ever heard of this? Oh boy. 
That didn't open in the way I wanted it to. Oh, bummer. How about we just do this? Oh boy. Okay. I'll let you stare at that for a minute. So first of all, notice that obviously something's spinning in the middle. And let's focus on maybe this guy right here, this, this loop. You think of this as a belt. Somehow this belt is able to be attached to this cube and it's fixed on this side. It's not spinning over here. It's just kind of wiggling up and down a little bit. But it never gets tangled up and it never has any kinks or crosses. In fact, it never crosses any of the other belts, which is particularly cool. Um, and I actually wore a belt today so I could demonstrate this for you. I'm going to be my... Can you pick? Okay. So the idea is that there, um, this is just the statement there that there are physical things in the universe that when you turn them around once, don't come back to what they used to be in the sense that they're, um, their uh, relative orientation, or what's sometimes I think called orientational entanglement, uh, is non-trivial. So if you take your belt, if you wear a belt, and you turn it 180 degrees, and we keep our orientations fixed, so he keeps his thumb up and I keep my thumb up, there's nothing I can do, you can convince yourself at home, to return this to the original state. But if you turn it once more all the way around, you can actually return it to the original state without changing the orientation of your thumb. Amazing. <laughs> so of course you can do this three times, I won't go through the details, but you do it three times, which is equivalent to, to one twist, five times. So any odd twist is equivalent. Any even twist is equivalent to, to no twist. And what's even cooler, I think, is that you can have these belts attached to an object from all sides, and they don't get in each other's way. You can you can manage all of these things at the same time. So, the um, uh, anyway, the uh, this this has a has a deep connection to the idea of spin statistics, which we all obviously won't get into today. But the difference between fermion and boson particles, um, and how they do or do not come back to themselves under this rotation of three hundred sixty. But you should check that out. It's also called the plate trick if you're looking it up. Okay. So what do we do with a quantum state? Well, we can um, evolve it with this operator U, which we call a unitary operator. And the unitary operator has the property that U, when multiplied on the left by U dagger, is the identity. And U dagger, which I didn't define here, is the um, transpose conjugate, meaning that you you um, you transpose all the elements about the diagonal, and you apply the complex conjugate to all the elements. And the gist of it, this is that the columns of the unitary matrix define an orthonormal basis in this Hilbert space or in this in this complex vector space. So what is <clears throat> what does uh, a unitary operator do to a vector? Well, if you look at um, this inner product here between two quantum vectors, psi and phi, modified by this um, product of unitaries here, by the definition of the unitary, or by the definition of unitarity here, um, this sandwich in the middle here reduces to the identity. And what this means is that the, um, the uh, transformed pair of vectors, or the overlap between the transformed pair of vectors, is the same as the overlap between the untransformed pair of vectors. And this is true for all vectors. So really all this does is it takes one orthonormal basis in your um, complex Hilbert space, complex vector space, and it rotates it to another um, orthonormal basis in that space. So that's all quantum systems is it locked? That's all quantum systems do. 
um, in, in this simplest picture. Of course, we have the Schrodinger equation, which is uh, um, an extremely important example of a unitary operator. So this just tells you how a particular state, or it gives you uh, the form for the unitary operator that tells you how to um, translate in time one particular um, input state, given this thing called the Hamiltonian, which describes the system. Uh, it contains the information about the, the structure of the system. And we won't get into this too much, um, except to say that the, uh, well, I guess we can go, we can talk about this a little bit. So if you take one of the energy eigenstates of this Hamiltonian here, which just means that this is one of the um, eigenvectors of this operator or matrix for us, then when you evolve this thing, all you get back is the same thing because, um, in a certain sense, because it's the eigenvector of this Hamiltonian, but you acquire this phase and the rate of the acquisition of the phase is dependent upon the energy. So the higher the energy, the faster you, the faster this phase goes around. But we said that phases weren't important, so in a sense this doesn't do anything. Um, time, time evolution does, is trivial. It's non-trivial when you have superpositions over your eigenstates or over your energy eigenstates. So if you operate with your unitary operator, your Schrodinger operator, on this um, simple superposition between two different energy eigenstates. Each one of these gets its own phase factor, but the phase factors depend on the corresponding energies. And so if you do the trick of pulling out the global phase, well, let's just pull out the E1, then this one returns to what it was before, but this one now has a difference. So we can, we can, we can ignore one global phase, but we can't ignore this relative phase. And the relative phase between this and this depends on this and the exponent, which is the difference between the two energies. So energy differences lead to um, the rate at which phase differences develop. And that's Schrodinger, right there. Okay, um, we go till 1.30? Okay. All right, so we have to talk about measurement because so far all this thing is doing is it's doing this giant rotation in a space and we have no interaction with the system. So this is the simplest model for a measurement, which we call projective measurement. And um, we are going to have these observables M, which are going to be modeled by Hermitian operators. And Hermitian means that this operator or matrix is equal to its adjoint, um, which simply means For us in our two-dimensional land, these have to be uh, um, let's see. So in order to be equal to your adjoint, you have to have real numbers on the diagonal, and you have to have the complex conjugate on the off diagonal. So these are just a very simple subclass of matrices. And because they're Hermitian, that means that they are also normal. And that means that we can apply the spectral decomposition that I think you guys talked about last time, probably at length. And what that means is that I can rewrite this operator M in terms of the set of projectors and the eigenvalues associated with each of those projectors. And we can think of these as being multi-dimensional projectors or single, it doesn't really matter. Um, and in the interpretation of this, of, this, uh, of this matrix or this operator as a measuring thing, these m's, these eigenvalues, correspond to the outcomes, and these projectors correspond to the subspaces that contain those the states that give you those outcomes, if you like. Okay. And then here we have essentially all we need, or, or most of what we need, in order to understand projective measurement. And this sometimes goes by the name of the Born rule. So you give me 
a particular state. And I can tell you the probability for obtaining a particular outcome, m, by just computing this inner product with the associated projector sandwiched in between. Okay. Let me, maybe I'll pause for questions on that one. Um, maybe should, uh, I guess I didn't talk about what projectors are. Is that familiar from the spectral stuff? What's a projector? What's the property that defines any projector? There you go. Yep, you do it again and you get the same thing. So you, um, you take a picture of a picture and you just get the picture. You, you have a three-dimensional scene, take a photo of it, that projects it onto your, onto your film. You take the same angle picture of that film and you just get that picture back again. If you were to take it from a different angle, you'd get a different picture, but you can also do that twice. Okay. The shadow of the shadow is the shadow. Okay, so that's what a projector is. Um, and, well, again, um, we can always write our, in, in some basis, we'll always be able to diagonalize M, and so we'll always be able to write that M is equal to U D times U dagger, where this is just the, um, the uh, complex analog of rotation where D is just my two eigenvalues, lambda 1, oops, lambda 2. I guess I call them M's up here. Okay? And what that means is that in this basis, D is lambda 1 times this projector plus lambda 2 times this projector. And is it clear that these guys are projectors? You multiply them by themselves and you get the same thing. So given any old state <clears throat> and given a Hermitian observable, you can compute the probability of obtaining any one of the results that the observable might, might yield. Okay, and the next question you can ask is what happens to my quantum thing after I perform this measurement? And under the projective measurement scenario, this is what happens. Um, the new state is equal to the old state modified by this projector and then um, normalized in some way. Actually, like this way of thinking of it. So the new state, given that I saw measurement M, is just the, uh, the projection of psi into the M um, subspace and then normalized so that this thing is unit norm. You know, you don't have to remember what this is, you just have to remember that it's unit norm. And the physical meaning of that is just that something came out of your measurement. Unit norm means it's there. Okay, and um, I told you I was going to talk a little bit about the, the stern gerlach experiment, and here it is. So what they did was they took some, so this is a, this is a magnet with a um, strong magnetic field um, in homogeneity here, and then they send in some neutral atoms, which I think were um, silver. So there's um, so there's one. The, the atom is neutral, but it has an unpaired electron. And what this means is that that unpaired electron can interact with this magnetic field. And instead of um, when we shoot in this stream of silver atoms through this magnetic field. You might expect that these, these atoms are going to be kind of oriented every which way, and so they'd interact in many different ways, and so that you'd get some kind of schmear in the output. But what happens is that you get two dots. You get one of two things happening. And the interpretation of this is that this device is a measuring device which implements this particular measurement, which, um, which has these two projectors, which we call 0 and 1, which correspond to these output states here and here. So, in other words, if I send an electron or one of these silver things 
through my apparatus and I see a little blip here, then I count that as a plus one. And if I see a little blip down here, I count that as a minus one. And I, and I don't see things in between. And so these projectors are sufficient to describe the measuring device. So I'm just trying to motivate that this, this measuring device has, has a physical implementation, which is interesting. Okay, so here we have the same thing again. And all I'm going to do is just go through the calculation of, of using this projective measurement scheme that I described to you before abstractly, using this particular measurement operator, which corresponds to that stern gerlach on a particular known input state. So how does this work? Well, we remember that um, I said that all I need to do in order to understand the post-measurement state is to, for a particular measurement outcome, just hit the incoming state with that projector, project it onto that subspace, and then just normalize it correctly. And the normalization is going to, in fact, be um, related to the square root of the probability of that thing happening. Okay, so here we are going to think about what happens if we have measurement outcome plus one. So we, have, we see a blip on top. What does that mean? Well, this is my projector that corresponds to the plus one outcome. And I'm, um, I'm, I'm uh, applying this to this input state. And now to unpack this notation a little bit, We've got a zero meeting a zero, which we interpret as an inner product. This is the reason that we use these bra ket notations. Um, it, it makes it convenient to see when inner products emerge. So we see this zero inner product with a zero, which is just the norm of this uh, vector, which is one. So we get one times zero, which is just zero, the zero vector back. The probability of that guy is just the um, square of this vector here, which is the inner product of it with itself, which is one, because this vector itself is normalized. A lot of things are one here, so it might be a little bit tricky to follow where all the ones and zeros are coming from. And then so the updated state in actuality is this previous state here that we weren't sure was normalized, but now we properly normalize it by dividing it by the square root of the probability, which we determined to be one. And so it's zero. So it's all a little bit degenerate. But um, OK, let's go through the next one. Other outcome minus 1 corresponding to projector 1, 1. So this projector 1, 1 hits this incoming state 0. A 1 with a 0, as we discussed, are orthogonal. We have 0 up and 1 down in our block sphere. So that means that these are orthogonal things. And the inner product then is 0. So 0 times this vector is just the, just the 0 vector, nothing. The probability then is just um, the norm of that guy, which is 0. And then this is essentially undefined because we're dividing by the probability, which is 0. So the upshot is if you use this measuring device, which is somehow um, kind of sorting things into up and down, and you put in something that's up or 0, it gives you, with 100% probability, the measurement up. So this makes good sense. And it never gives you probability of, it never gives you the other outcome, which is minus 1. OK. So maybe that was a lot of detail. Is that OK so far? OK. All right, let's do one that's not trivial, and then, then you'll I hopefully be more comfortable with how this calculation actually works. Okay, so the same projector, or the same measurement um, operator, but a different input state now. Okay, so how does this work? So we're analyzing first the outcome up. So we're going hit to hit this incoming state with that same projector, 0, 0. Uh, this is a linear operator, so I can just take it inside this sum. And it's going to act on this thing the same way that it did before. Um, which is to give me a 0 with a 0, which is unit, and then uh, a 0 vector out. So that's how I get this 1 over root 2, 0 here. This projector acting on this part of the superposition gives me 
one or zero for the same reason, which is because the zero vector and the one vector orth are orthogonal. Um, so unlike before, this thing is not a normalized vector. So then the probability associated with this outcome is the square magnitude of this vector, the square magnitude of that guy, which is a half. 1 over 2 squared is a half. And then the resulting post-measurement state is just this unnormalized state here, here, divided by the square root of the probability, which is square root of a half. So this gets rid of this, and we're just left with zero. So to summarize, inputting this particular superposition of up and down together gives me, with probability one half, the outcome of plus one. And upon seeing this outcome, I then know with certainty that my the outcoming um, quantum state is just this bare zero ket, as opposed to this incoming superposition. So the superposition has been projected into the zero subspace. And the story is um, identical over here. We have one half probability of seeing the other thing and getting out this one ket. Okay. I'll point out that I think when you when you start doing quantum mechanics, um, at least I remember uh, that the idea of expectation value comes up um, immediately. People are well w when you're trying to measure the say the energy of something, you're typically um, performing measurements on you know atoms streaming out of a out of a maser or I don't know what it is, but you're doing you're doing big measurements, um, measurements of ensembles that are, are often difficult to distinguish, especially earlier when, when we measure things. And so people are naturally more interested in expectation values because you're measuring this flood of particles coming into your apparatus. Um, interestingly, oh, and the point being that the expectation value, well, let's go through it here. The expectation value is just defined as the probability of a particular measurement outcome times this eigenvector or eigenvalue associated with that outcome um, as an average, which following through leads you to this, look, this nice looking form, which is just the sandwich of the incoming state and the measurement um, operator of interest. So we've got some vector on the right, vector on the left, and a matrix in the middle. And what you're doing is you're picking out a, a matrix element of this guy. In some basis, okay. And the and the point that I was getting to is that this is the first time that we've seen that the eigenvalues of M have come into play. So up until now, and this is a little bit confusing sometimes. Um, up until now, the eigenvalues only served to label things. They were really just categorical, and so that falls nicely into the kind of thinking of the computational mechanics. Um, but from a more physics perspective, is a little bit confusing. So. So here's a little bit of physics. Any questions so far? Greg? No? You look bewildered. OK, it's just your natural state. OK, good. It's a good way to be. All right. Um, well, projective measurement wasn't enough, so let's Let's define a more general notion of measurement. We're going to define this uh, general measurement in terms of some set of measurement operators. So these, again, are going to be in our context, um, or at least in this two-dimensional context, they're going to be two by two matrices. And we are going to define um, the probabilities in an analogous way where rather than having some projector sitting here, we're going to have an M dagger and an M which kind of stand in for the projector. Uh, so we have an analogous Born rule for computing probabilities. And then we have an analogous way of computing post-measurement states. And that is um, quite analogous. Here we have some kind of projector-looking thing or this measurement operator on the incoming state. And then it's just normalized in a way to make it unit norm. And that's all that's going on down there. And you can see that this guy here um, is did I miss a square root?
Uh, one of the popular categories of this more general measurement scheme is called the POVM, or the Positive Operator Valued Measure. This is also just some set of measurement operators. Um, but if you like, you can, you can hide this, and you can say that all I'm really interested in are these things, which we'll just call E, which are the concatenation of this M dagger and M. And if you see before, maybe this is simple, but the probabilities here only depend on this combination of M dagger and M. And it's only the post-measurement state that depends on the M's individually. Yeah? Do we want to square root in the denominator? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. Yep, for the same reason that we want. The square root of this probability. On the square root of this probability. Okay. So if you're not interested in the post measurement state, you can hide these M's. Uh, or it may be more convenient um, mathematically to say sample in this space or something like that. Um, and you can work, you can choose to work with just these E's. And these E's, oh, something I forgot to mention is this completeness. Um, yep. Uh, these E's are sufficient in order to compute the probabilities. Although you can see that there's some degeneracy here in what the underlying M's would be. So different, different um, measurement schemes could give rise to the same measurement statistics, but have different uh, conditional states, associated conditional states, which is not a crazy thing to think about. Okay, and the thing that I left out previously is this completeness relation here. And this just says that the, the sum of all these guys is equal to one. So in the context of projective measurement, what does this say? This says that the sum of all the projectors, projectors is one. So over here we have one projector and another projector. And you can see that the sum of these two projectors, sorry, by one I mean the identity. So the sum of these two guys is the identity. The sum of all my E's has to be the identity. And similarly, the sum of all my M dagger M's um, in the previous more general form has to be the identity. That's one of the constraints. One of the nice things about this, uh, about this representation, which is why it's called the positive operator valued measure is that these things, because of their construction as M dagger M's, are known to be positive operators, which means that for um, any, any inner product, uh, they, they return a positive number. It doesn't mean that they are constructed of numbers that are all positive, necessarily. Um, these are it's confusing when you look around because I think sometimes people will mix this, this terminology whether they're trying to talk about a matrix that has positive elements or a matrix that is positive in this way as an op operator positive. So watch out. Um, okay, so I highlighted on one of the early slides the, the notion of the inner product. And I said that the inner product was important. And the inner product is important because it has to do with this idea of distinguishability. So the question is, given two non-orthogonal states, can we distinguish them? So given a psi 1 and a psi 2, where these are known to be non-orthogonal, can I distinguish them by any measurement scheme? So let's, let's suppose that we can. Let's suppose that there is some measurement scheme that allows us to do this. So we're going to call, and we'll use the POVM formalism because we're just interested in these um, probabilities as opposed to the post-measurement states. So I'm going to choose an E1 and an E2 such that if you give me, uh, if you give me a psi 1, that the, and there should be a probability here, the probability of obtaining outcome 1 given input 1 is 1. So this is a constraint on my E1. 
and this is the analogous constraint on E2. So if there is such an E1 and an E2 that such that these sandwiches equal one, then I have a reliable way of distinguishing input state psi1 from psi2. Okay, and we don't have to go through all the, the nitty-gritty details, or you can look at these on your own time. Um, but the punchline is that this psi2, if we demand that it is orthogonal to, or not orthogonal, sorry, yes, not orthogonal to psi1, it means that um, there, there must be some of each of these components here, alpha and beta. Um, if beta were equal to 1, then it, it would be um, all, I'm sorry, I'm defining uh, phi to be orthogonal to psi1. So if it were all in, the, all in the second component, if beta were equal to 1, then phi2 would be orthogonal to um, psi1, or psi2 psi would be orthogonal to psi1. So by using this completeness relation, um, you can pretty quickly arrive at the conclusion that this thing beta squared is um, less than or equal to 1, which is um, equal back here to this inner product of psi 1 and, or psi 2 and psi 2 with E2 in the middle. And the contradiction here is with the fact that we set this up as having to equal um, exactly 1. And so the upshot is that under the very general class of measurements that we've defined in terms of these POVMs or these um, general M dagger M measurement schemes, there is no way to reliably distinguish two states that are non-orthogonal. So geometrically, what does that mean? Um, it's just maybe more straightforward to say geometrically. If two vectors, and we'll do this in real space maybe, if two vectors are pretty similar, then you squint and they're hard to tell apart. This is, of course, very coarse. But if two vectors are orthogonal, then it's easy to tell them apart. And, and this is just um, proving to you that if they have this property where they're, they're uh, not orthogonal, then there is no possible way of concocting a measurement scheme that you could somehow broaden this angle or something and then measure them. Okay. So here's kind of a funny thing. So I just spent a few minutes trying to convince you that if um, two things are not orthogonal, that we can't distinguish them. And I'm going to show you that you can. <laughs> okay, so these are my two possible input states. And we can see that they're not orthogonal, right? Um, you can see that uh, if they were orthogonal, we could have maybe 0 and 1. But this one has a bit of the 0 component to it. So in a sense, um, they're, they're both alike in that direction. So they have a little bit of commonality. So they're non-orthogonal. OK. And that should be a root 2. All right, so these are my two input states. And the question is, using the, this set of measurement operators, E1, 2, E3, measuring my input, can I can I tell you for sure which input you gave me? So let's see if we can kind of eyeball this. So what happens if you give me a psi 1? Well, if you give me a psi 1, uh, which is the 0 vector, could I ever get an outcome of E1? Well, the, this psi 1, which is 0, um, has no overlap or uh, is, is, um, is killed by this projector here because 1 is orthogonal to 0. So the probability associated with this measurement outcome has to be 0. So you know that psi 1s never lead to E1s. So if you get an E1, then you know you must have had a psi 2 for sure. 
Okay. And that comes from the fact that this state is orthogonal to this projector, or is killed by this projector. Similarly, look at this guy here. You can convince yourself that it is orthogonal to this projector here. So E2, or the probability of getting measurement outcome E2 given psi2 is zero. So if you get an E2, then you know that you must have had an e, uh, psi1 input. And that's a, that's a perfect result. So what, what's the contradiction here? E1 and E2 aren't complete. E1 and E2 are not complete, that's true. Mm -hmm. So let's start with, say, psi 2. Put in a psi 2, and let's compute the probabilities. So we were doing this backwards, we were doing the conditioning backwards. So give me a psi 2. Let's compute the probability of this, this, and this. Well, the probability of this one is going to be something because um, this projector is looking for ones and it has some component of one, so this will be something. This will be nothing because this guy is orthogonal to this guy. But this will also be something. In other words, this won't capture everything. So there will be two possible measurements. And what happens if it's E3? If it's E3, then I don't have the same, um, same reasoning that I had before to back out the input state. So E3 gives me no knowledge. So interestingly, you can construct this simple situation where you do have per per perfect distinguishability, um, but you just don't get it every time. So it's kind of an interesting twist to that story. Okay, so um, for those that have had some quantum mechanics, but maybe not more quantum mechanics, you might not have seen mixed states. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit about what mixed states are why we, and why we want them. Okay, so the physical situation I'm envisioning is that we have an input to our stern gerlach device, which is a random choice of up or down. So before I told you, I think we analyzed the possibility that we were shooting in this state here. But let's imagine that this has a choice of being either one of those and there's some coin flip or something that's going on inside the machine and it's shooting in one of these two things. Okay. Um, well, what, what would we see in our experiment? Well, the, um, we know that when we sent this thing in, because our, our projectors are aligned with these very states, when we sent this thing in, we were sure to see plus one. When we sent this thing in, we were sure to see minus one. But if we're sending these things in with a coin flip determining which one we send, then what we see is plus one or minus one with, as a coin flip. Right? Okay. So what is the appropriate... Here I wrote this thing. I should have maybe written, you know, squiggle or something. Because this isn't this isn't really what I've told you is a is a state. It's the set of things with a coin flip. So what is the state that this should be? How should I represent this? Well, we already know how to do this. We saw this earlier. That was in the second example of the projective measurement, when we had a had a um, superposition with zero and one. So if you remember. Plus or minus doesn't matter. When you come in with a projector 0, 0, you pick out this piece and you get this amount squared. When you come in with a projector 1, 1, you hit this piece and you get, again, this squared, which is a half. So this input state under this measurement scheme gives you the statistics that we're looking for. So we already know how to model this thing. Okay, but the question is, if this is supposed to represent the state, meaning 
the the impinging beam of stuff into the the Stern Gerlach experiment, then I ought to be able to do something to my experiment and use the same model of my state. Or at least that's a pretty reasonable definition of what you think a state is. Do you agree? If a state depends on what question you ask of it, then what is the sense of thinking of it as the state? Talk a lot about states here, right? We can be abstract. Okay, so what happens if I use a different Stern Gerlach, which has this form, and uh, this just corresponds to rotating? So these things here are rotations of my standard um, up and down into left and right. Okay, and it's a little bit of an ugly thing to look at, but that's okay. And so, um, what should the output of this be if I give you what I told you I'm putting in? So if I put in, if I flip a coin and put in one of these, or I flip a coin and put in one of these, what should my what should my rotated Stern Gerlach give you? Well, if you go through and count up your halves, you see that it should still be up and down with probability one half. Or now it's left and right, really, but I'm still calling them plus one and minus one. Um, we can just do one of these. Okay. So with probability a half, I'm going to give you this. So I take my zero and I come over here. And, um, oh, I missed one. Uh, I get a zero. Pardon me. I get a zero from this contribution, and I get a zero from this contribution, which tells me that um, conditionally I'll have a 50% chance of getting either measurement up or plus or minus. And um, I was flipping the coin and giving you that zero with a probability of a half. So these are now total probabilities of a quarter and a quarter. But now I'm doing the same thing with this one, flipping a coin with probability of a half. You now have a one coming in. The one over here will either hit this guy and give you a probability of a half, or hit this guy, oh, I missed him, and give you a probability of a half. So again, a quarter and quarter. And since you, you uh, have thrown away your correlation with the initial thing, now all you're seeing is with probability of half, you have plus, probability of half, you have minus. Okay. So we're seeing the same thing that we did with our, our upright Stern Gerlach. I told you before that we had a model. We already knew how to model this thing in our, in our state formalism with a superposition. So if that is truly the state, then it ought, to act, it ought to act correctly under this new measurement. And what does it do? Well, if you take this thing, which we're proposing is the candidate model, and you come over here, you get a 1, and if you come over here, you get annihilated. So there's no probability of, ha of seeing a plus 1, and all probability of seeing minus 1, which is here. And this disagrees with what we know the output must be. So the model that we proposed is only a correct model if you don't do anything to your, your measuring device, which seems that it's a, like it's a pretty fragile notion of a state. So if we want to allow ourselves to do anything with the measuring apparatus and, and still call the same thing a state, um, I could, you could come up with other examples of this and show that they're all incorrect. Um, but the punchline is that uh, this type of object that we've defined so far is insufficient to capture this kind of simple physical behavior. Um, and that simple physical behavior is taking either one of these quantum things that we had and throwing it in, or flip a coin and throw this other quantum thing in. So apparently we can't even model that. So we need this new notion of what we're going to call a density operator, or a density matrix. Um, it can be defined as a unit trace, which means that the sum of the diagonal elements, if it's a matrix, is 1. 
operator, and it's also positive in the sense of a positive operator, not positive elements. But more concretely, you can think of it like this. You can think of it as arising from this probabilistic mixture of these old things that we had as quantum states, but in an, in a, in an outer product space with themselves. So we're looking in the outer product space of the original quantum states, and we're looking at um, the, uh, the vector space that arises from um, linear combinations of these things. Okay, so how to represent this thing that I was trying to explain with, with words? Well, it's exactly this. With one half probability, I'm giving you this quantum state, which I'm representing this way now. And with one half probability, I'm giving you this state. And note that this is not the same as uh, something like one half. No. First of all, this is not normalized. If it were normalized, it's still not right because this is what we looked at before as our candidate model, or with a with a plus instead of a minus. Okay? So this is truly a new thing. We're in a new space. And we couldn't have achieved this object with the with the tools that we had before. Okay. Um, an interesting feature of these density operators or density matrices is that they're non-unique. So this one, which is the one that we were just talking about, which is a half up, half down, well, in our two-by-two two matrix form, just looks like this. It's half of the identity. I can think of this half of the identity as arising from this uh, decomposition, some probability of this guy plus some probability of this guy, this guy meaning the outer product of some quantum state with itself. Or I can think of it in another way. I can think of it as some probabilistic combination of two things which are outer products with themselves. But these states are not equal to these states. So I have a, a non-unique decomposition of, um, of, this, uh, of this ensemble. So that means that if you have two machines one of them flips a coin and it spits out ups and downs and you have another machine that flips a coin and it spits out these or these, you can't tell the difference. There's no measurement that you can perform on just that output that will, that will distinguish these two machines. Just, I think, a pretty interesting fact. And to give you some geometric intuition, which um, I think is really useful, actually. For qubits, you can think of these things. So we had, uh, for our original quantum states, we put these on the surface of the sphere. Well, it's just very nice and convenient that the, uh, the corresponding um, density matrices live on the sphere and also inside the sphere. And so the new stuff that we get is now inside the sphere. And so let's just look real quickly at how this, how this works. So a particular, just like we had that uh, um, parameterization that Greg asked about with the x, y, and z, we have this parameterization here where, let's say, given a particular r, which is a point in three space, and now I'm allowed to be inside the ball if I want to be inside the ball. So given some vector r, I dot that thing with this sigma vector, which is just a vector of matrices, these Pauli matrices. That gives me some linear combination of um, two by two matrices plus a half of the identity, and that gives me the corresponding density operator. And this is invertible. Okay? So, geometrically, to explain what we are doing over here, um, the fact that this same density matrix can be represented in two different ways, we can interpret this now geometrically on the block sphere and understand that it's one way. Well, first of all, the, uh, the state that we're interested in here is called this max mix state in this case, which is the one half times the identity. Um, and if we look at, well, how do we get, how do we get one half the identity? Well, that's right here already. And so we want apparently R to be zero. So R zero means that we're at the origin. So the origin is this state. 
Okay. Um, the two decompositions that I gave you were, one of them was some of this and some of this, half and half. Another one was some of this and some of this, half and half. And it's a fact that uh, the resulting density operator that you get by performing combinations of pure states on the surface of the sphere is exactly the, the um, geometric center of mass of these two things inside the sphere. So half this plus half this is exactly the middle. Uh, and if you had half of this and half of this, you'd be somewhere up here in the crown of the, of the sphere. And the same holds true actually for mixing density matrices. You could take this, uh, take some density matrix like this, take some other density matrix like this, and these could be the products of two machines and you could have a meta machine which mixes these things as input to some measurement. And then the, the combination of these two things is similarly this, just this center of mass mixture. Okay. Now these density operators evolve in a nice way. Instead of um, requiring just one unitary, you can see, huh? Sorry, uh, yep. can you go back to the block sphere? For sure. Me? So when you use the block sphere to represent mixed states, can you represent operations the same way as you do with just the pure state? So for example, a spin flip matrix is usually just a rotation about y. Mm -hmm. Is it the same in this representation? The spin flip. Or just any operation, right? Mm -hmm. You just represent them as rotations on, of the block sphere usually? Yep. Does it work with the... So one answer is that the, the action of that operator on the pure states defines the action of the operator on the mixed states by linearity. So think of your old spin flip, do it on the sphere, and then just look at all combinations of those things and that tells you how the insides have to move. Good question. Okay, mixed states. So before we had one unitary that attacked the, the psi vector and, and updated it as in the Schrodinger equation. And now here we just um, sort of intuitively, you imagine that you need two unitaries, one to deal with the bra part and one to deal with the ket part. Um, and then just to show that you can write this thing down, um, this is what the measurement scheme looks like for mixed states. It's very similar. You have some set of measurement operators M. You get probabilities by having, instead of your psi, you have now your rho and still your M dagger M. But we use a trace um, because kind of the, the two sides are already contained in this one object, so we don't need two of them. Anyway, um, you can write this thing down. It looks pretty similar, and um, maybe you could go through a computation of these on your own, but I don't, I don't think they're particularly illuminative. illuminative. Oh, illuminating. Okay, so I'm going to end on uh, just a quick comment about or introduction to entropy in the quantum world. As opposed to the Shannon entropy that you guys have been studying this quarter, we're going to talk about the von Neumann entropy. And it is defined in this way. Oops, I forgot my minus sign. <laughs> okay, so uh, the von Neumann entropy usually indicated S of a particular density operator is given by minus the trace of rho log rho, where rho is the state. Now, because rho is defined to be a positive operator, we can um, apply the spectral decomposition, which means that we can essentially get rid of the unitaries by making use of the cyclicity of the trace. And we end up with this trace of d log d, where d is the diagonal um, center of our matrix, which is really just uh, the... Um, the uh, minus sign, Shannon entropy, over the eigenvalues of the operator, which is not necessarily the Shannon entropy over the diagonal elements of the operator in some cases. Okay, and um, just to give you something to hang on to, what does the von Neumann entropy tell you about a quantum state? Well, one thing it tells you is the minimal randomness that you would see 
in uh, complete projective measurement of that system. So, to illustrate. Let's start with just this input state here. We'll consider rho, which is equal to this. And we want to understand what is the von Neumann entropy of that state. It corresponds to the state on the surface of the block sphere. Well, I can think about all the particular um, complete projective measurements, which in this case are just the stern gerlach experiments with rotations that I can apply to this thing. And what's the least amount of uh, entropy that I can get? Well, if I measure with my, my up-down one that we started with, I'll get all my measurements will give me plus and no, no down. So that's one possibility. That has pretty low entropy, so that's probably the minimum. But you could look at other, you could rotate, and you could rotate so that you're projecting along these directions, and then you'd get 50-50 as your outcome, which would be one bit, so that's clearly not the minimum. So you can see, um, at least you can convince yourself that, uh, that this has zero von Neumann entropy, and an, inter an interpretation of that is you can tune your stern gerlach to give you just um, one single outcome every time. Um, and maybe one other example, which is the max mix state in the middle, which we wrote as a half of the identity. Well, if I put my stern gerlach this way, I'm going to get 50-50 in my output. If I put it this way, just by symmetry, you can see, I'm going to get 50-50 in my output. There's nothing I can do to get away from having one bit of entropy in my output. So that's how I can understand this entropy to be um, one bit for this state. You can also see that this thing is already diagonalized, and so the von Neumann entropy of this guy is just the Shannon entropy of um, the diagonal elements. And then one final slide, which we don't have to discuss. So to kind of make all of this stuff physical and to tie into more closely what you've been talking about with computational mechanics, um, you're familiar with the with Shannon's noise, noiseless coding theorem, which tells you that the entropy rate of an IAD source tells you something about the um, the uh, communication rate at which you can produce a reliable compression scheme. That's the, the, the minimum compression rate or the minimum transmission rate. The analogous quantum result is called Schumacher's noiseless coding theorem, and it says analogously that it is the von Neumann entropy, S of rho, which we just defined, that tells you about this uh, minimum communication rate in terms of qubits, or quantum states, as opposed to um, bits. And so um, this is a very important result because it, it really... Uh, it, it really makes um, rigorous the meaning of quantum information theory at all. So um, we'll stop there for today, and next time I want to talk about some of these things. So we'll do that. Thanks.